Um, hi, my name is Adrian, and I'm here to talk to you about a brand new open source framework which uh, my company launched just two months ago called Streamlit. Um, and we've been in private beta for about a year, working with companies like Uber and Stitch Fix and IBM Research to develop Streamlit. Um, and uh, we finally released it about two months ago. And um, it's been a actually kind of a wild ride. There's been like exponential growth, and there's a lot of activity on Twitter that you can see about people building cool stuff in Streamlit. Um, and this is actually the first time that we talk about it uh, sort of publicly. Um, so first of all, show of hands, how many of you have heard of Streamlit? Cool. All right. Um, have you guys used Streamlit? OK, awesome. Um, so well, nice to meet you in person. <laughs> um, and for the rest of you, I'm happy to excited to show you what we're going to do here. So the outline for today's talk is, uh, or today's demo really, is this. So uh, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about um, sort of the space in the Python data and machine learning ecosystem that we uh, see Streamlit filling and the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and then uh, you guys are all going to be able to install it uh, if you want and play with it. Uh, and then we're going to build a cool app. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the really deep motivating examples for building Streamlit. <laughs> He's like, I've already used it. Um, and so uh, some of the deep motivating examples for using Streamlit. Um, and so I'll, to, to sort of motivate that, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. So I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University for eight years. And I did uh, a whole lot of machine learning and big data stuff. And then I went to Google X, and I ran a machine learning group there uh, working on natural language systems. Then I went to Zoox, uh, which is a $4 billion self-driving car company, uh, and again, uh, ran a big machine learning group there. And then uh, I saw at all of those companies the same kinds of problems uh, sort of happening over and over again. And so um, that's why I started Streamlit with some friends in 2018. Um, let me also say, by the way, that given that my roots are in academia, I just strongly feel that it's way more fun if people ask questions at any times. Um, so please like, raise your hand and ask a question at any time. It's just, it's just more fun for everyone, including me. Um, any questions? OK. All right. Um, so what was this problem that I was uh, seeing over and over again? Um, and that hopefully you guys might be sort of aware of too. And the, the, basically, when people typically talk about the industrial machine learning workflow at Uber or something like that, what they're saying is that um, we have some data, and then we perform training on that data, and then we build models, and then eventually we put those models in production, and it's all very complicated, and we have to build lots of software to support this entire ecosystem. And this is definitely a very real, difficult, important part of the machine learning sort of uh, you know, pipeline. Um, and uh, in fact, there's a whole crop of like amazing startups in this space right now uh, working on different aspects of this pipeline and trying to be a horizontal layer or take off different vertical pieces. And so I'm actually really excited that like in a couple of years, this whole process is going to look totally different and way less bespoke than it does today. But notwithstanding this sort of major production pipeline, the thing that I really saw as a machine learning practitioner and I saw again and again on Teams is that machine learning engineers are actually app makers. That is, they often build a large number of uh, bespoke apps both to demonstrate data, like actually the previous session uh, in this room sort of demonstrated some, some simple uh, panel apps to do that. Um, also to sort of provide the interstitial structure for the machine learning group in, in, in order to uh, look at, you know, parse large data sets, uh, coordinate with uh, other members of the team to see how models run on different data sets. There's internal tooling to do that. And then also to project sort of the power of the machine learning group out throughout the organization. Um, so we're, we're working with a big company right now, for example, to allow machine learning engineers to directly build apps that empower 100,000 salespeople to make real-time recommendations. 
Okay? So these are the kinds of apps that we saw um, again and again being built by machine learning engineers and really seeing that this was a, actually a major pain point in the process. Okay, why is this a pain? First of all, before I get started, uh, do you, guys, do you guys feel this? Have you guys been building small apps in Jupyter Notebooks or perhaps with Flask uh, to, to, to solve problems like those I described? Maybe show of hands. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, uh, did you build it in Jupyter? Okay, Flask. Okay, cool. Uh, Plotly Dash. Okay, you've built it in everything. Uh, RStudio. Shiny. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so, uh, so what what typically happens in this case? So I'm going to give you the example of Zeus. So we had about uh, 80 machine learning engineers building self-driving cars. This is everything from the planning system to vision, uh, pedestrian detection, um, the entire self-driving stack, basically. And uh, so an example of a tool that we would have to write would be um, uh, something that would allow us to take two simulations of the self-driving car and run them at the same time and compare them to one another. So typically, this kind of tool would start off as like a solo programming project for a single engineer. So uh, he or she is doing some work, maybe in a Jupyter notebook. They are actually running the simulations. Lo and behold, this is the typical engineering you know, cycle. Gosh, I'm doing this over and over again. I should automate this more and more. So maybe we copy and paste it into a script, um, check it into GitHub. Now there's a way of running this app. Um, and inevitably what happens in this case is that if the tool is important, if a lot of people need to use it, uh, all of a sudden it becomes a central focus point for the group and now we need to add new features every single week and the app wasn't designed to be like a well-designed app that you can really add features to readily and so you get into this unmaintainability trap, okay? So then what we would do at a certain point if a tool was really used by a lot of people on the team is we would call the tools team. And this is a group of people who, uh, they were sort of an internal infrastructure team for the company, and they were really sort of subject matter, matter experts in building um, you know, web apps. And so they, were, they had expertise in uh, React or Vue and, and how you build the entire stack. And they would follow the sort of standard app building uh, flow, which is to collect requirements and lay out these things and then wire them together with the various events and so on, and then code it up. And you would get a very beautiful app at this point, usually. Uh, very fast and, and you know had all the correct features and so on and so forth, which was amazing. But then they'd say, OK, uh, we just built your app for your team. We'll get back to you in a couple months because we we're supporting 10 other teams. Okay, so what we got to was this sort of like frozen zone where the, the problem was uh, machine learning engineers either couldn't edit these apps, um, or I should say really didn't want to, um, or they did, but it was at great, great, uh, it, took, it was really time consuming. Um, so, so that's really the observation about the state of this sort of really crucial workflow in the world. Um, and so with that background, uh, I'm now going to take you uh, through uh, first what is Streamlit, and then we'll all get to play with it a little bit. Okay? Any questions or thoughts at this point? Thumbs up? All right, cool. Oh, yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, no, you're just giving a thumbs up? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so what is Streamlit? So, Streamlit is an app framework for machine learning engineers and data scientists specifically. And the starting point for Streamlit was very different from, I think, most app frameworks out there. We basically asked ourselves, what if we could make building these kinds of internal tools and web apps that machine learning engineers and data scientists build as easy as writing Python scripts? So our fundamental assumption is that you are a Python programmer and that you um, are writing scripts in Python and that you use this sort of traditional script writing flow, which is iterative, execution from top to bottom, 
Of course, that can be changed in a Jupyter notebook. That's okay too. Um, what you're not doing necessarily is starting with a layout and then trying to figure out an event model, right? It's much more about sort of a data flow transformation model in terms of how you build the apps. And what we wanted to do was build an amazing app framework that really uh, started with this Python scripting idea. And so this is the app that I'm gonna um, show you and we're gonna, we're not gonna build all of it, but we'll build some of it at the very end. Um, and what this is, is a, um, it's actually a data browser for self-driving car image data. And there, in fact, there's a little semantic search engine up on the upper left there on the right. And you can select the number of uh, sort of various semantic features and images, like number of pedestrians, and you can scrub through them. Um, and then you can actually run a network, a neural network, uh, in this case, YOLO v3, just an example, uh, in real time on this data set, okay? And this entire app is 300 lines of Python. And in fact, there are only 30 streamlet calls in the entire app. So the other 270 lines of Python are actually the neural net and all of the data processing. So you can imagine this is basically a data script, which has been slightly annotated to make it an interactive app. And that's really the goal here. Okay. Questions, thoughts? I'm gonna start asking myself questions. Um, what's on the next slide, Adrian? Okay, uh, we are going to uh, now, um, if you're interested, uh, install and play with Streamlit. So um, get out your laptops. Um, actually, before we get out your laptops, uh, are you guys, raise your hand if you're able to install packages with PIP on your laptop. Okay, cool, everyone, sweet. I'm at the right conference. <clears throat> All right, so in that case, get out your laptops um, and get a terminal. And we are gonna do the following, which is pip install streamlet. Oh, by the way, uh, this is a, a open source project on GitHub, uh, Apache 2 license. Uh, you can look through all the source code. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll feel comfortable with pip install streamlet. I will do it myself. So here's my uh, text editor here. And I'm just going to do uh, pip install, in my case, upgrade. You don't have to do that. Okay, and uh, so now um, you could run, for example, um, Streamlit version, just to see that uh, things are not broken. Should be 0.51. Who has, who has 0.51? Okay, very few people. Oh, okay, okay, more. Do I need to wait here? Raise your hand if you want more time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the question is realistically, when can we buy autonomous cars? Uh, I'll give you the same answer I would have given you five years ago, in three years. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you another answer. So um, I, I, this, is, this is unfortunately not gonna satisfy your desire to buy a self-driving car uh, for Christmas, but um, it was an answer. I actually, it turns out that I was, I was on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon um, in the computer science department, robotics institute, and a friend of mine was Chris Ermson, who ended up, went on to lead the Google self-driving car project, now called Waymo. And I was like, so tell me what's going on with this self-driving car thing. And he said, well, it's really simple. What the car has to do is draw a lot of boxes around things and then not hit those boxes. <clears throat> uh, 
And it really just comes down to like how many nines we have on those two tasks. And uh, each nine is getting harder and harder to get. So, um, Okay, who needs more time? You need more time? I can keep going. OK, um, so pip install streamlet. OK, and now streamlet version 0.51. So now here's the fun thing to do. Um, streamlet, hello. OK, and now what's going to happen is it's going to uh, open a little uh, web, web server on your computer. And uh, here we see streamlet running. Um, and we have this little think doohickey here on the left that comes out. And these are a couple different demos. So uh, I'll show you some cool demos here. So here's, a, here's an animation demo. Ooh, fractals. Okay. And, uh, and down here it actually shows you uh, the code that it took to make this demo. And uh, interestingly, uh, it's all the fractals. <laughs> uh, I think there's only like a one or two little streamlet calls here. So we have a little rerun button. And then um, I'm going to get to this in a moment. Uh, but uh, you can change things about the fractals. So we could do that, for example. And now the fractals are more separate. Cool. Here's another example. Um, plotting demo. So this basically just shows like a random walk um, using Altair, which is, by the way, a super rad uh, graphing library made by some good folks at Google, uh, based on Vega Light, based on D3. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Mapping demo. This one's fun. By the way, I'm just going to wrap random sweet graphing libraries. Uh, DeckGL by Uber is so cool. Um, so here we have, I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit so we can see everything at the same time. Zoom out. Okay, so here we have, um, we can sort of turn on and off for the different layers really fast. It's pretty cool. Uh, and again, this is, um, this is the code right here. And this is, uh, basically most of this code is just DECGL. Okay, so there's almost no streamlet to do this. And that's kind of, I hope you get the, the sort of the theme that I'm getting at here, which is that uh, I'm going to hopefully give you guys like a cool superpower that you can use uh, in your work and in your own workflow. Um, I should also, by the way, mention that this is not only free and open source, um, but it runs entirely locally on your machine. So for example, this is just running on my laptop, so there's no like data leaking out or anything like that. Um, we do collect analytics, but you can turn that off. Um, that's so that our investors give us more money. Um, uh, but, but there's no, we don't, we don't know anything about what you're doing. And in fact, if, if you could turn off the internet, which I won't do now because the gods of the demo will get mad at me. Um, you could turn off your internet and this would all just continue working perfectly. Okay. So there's no, there's no cloud thing going on here. Um, cool. In fact, you'll see that this is actually at localhost 8501. Yeah. Why is Bato 3 a dependency? Um, remind me what Bato 3 does again. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so um, if you, so, okay, if you install, um, uh, if you set a setting, actually, this is really, we should probably get rid of that dependency. If you set a setting in your config.tuml file, you can actually save, um, your streamlet reports to, uh, to uh, a cloud server. And in fact, the way that, that we configure that is um, on an S3 bucket for a, for a corporate customer, actually. So for example, um, at Uber, we set it up so that they could save streamlet reports to an internal uh, S3 bucket that they had. And Bodo3 is actually a, a reflection of that. Um, but uh, it actually, it, I could actually pip uninstall uh, Bodo3 and it, everything should still work. Again, I'm not going to do it now because I don't want to upset the demo gods, but yeah. Um, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, and by the way, I should, that's a great question. I'm gonna repeat the questions too. So the first question was, or the last question anyway was, uh, Bodo three, why do we, why do we, is that a dependency? And indeed, it's because there is a functionality which is off by default that lets you upload your Streamlit apps uh, to a S3 server, okay. And the second question was, um, what charting libraries do we support? Um, and uh, actually, the shout out here is to Jupyter because uh, we basically get to, um, Jupyter means that there's tons of awesome Python bindings for all kinds of awesome uh, things. And we essentially can plug them into Streamlet practically for free. Um, so I, I suggest that you go to the docs, um, which are right here, streamlet.io slash docs. Um, but uh, and there's, it shows you everything, but uh, DuckGL, Plotly, um, Matplotlib, Bokeh, HollowViews, um, uh, Altair, VegaLite, um, uh, I can probably think of, uh, LaTeX, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the question is, can you handle events? Yeah, I'm gonna show you how to, how to do interactive stuff, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So the question is: um, Is this? Uh, uh, is there anything at all for more than a shiny app? So, um, uh, so the well, we see this playing a similar role in the Python ecosystem that Shiny does in the R ecosystem. Um, as you'll see, there's a very different sort of programming style to Streamlit. Um, so when we get into that, you can you can see whether you like it or not. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the question is, how do you deploy a Streamlit app? So right now we don't offer we don't offer a solution to that. You can go online and you can find like uh, probably one or two dozen tutorials about Streamlit on EC2 and AW, um, EC2 and uh, Heroku and all these things. Um, and so there's actually a fair amount of information. There's a growing body of information written by the uh, community on how to deploy Streamlit apps. Um, in fact, we are also developing a deployment uh, solution called Streamlit for Teams, and that's going to be the enterprise version of Streamlit. Yeah, so that's how that's how we will eventually make money. Although we're not making money now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So the question is. Um, uh, what about Azure? What about GCP or, or other cloud providers? So right now, you'll find tutorials written by the community online for every major cloud provider and also things like Docker containers and so on and so forth. So it is a little bit of a um, involved process right now. Um, and so uh, I apologize for that. Um, but if you're, if you're sort of fluent in those technologies, you can get it done. Um, and we, we encourage people to sort of, you know, write, write more tutorials if you'd like to, if you come up with a better way of doing it. Um, so we also hope to make that a really amazing experience for our users, um, but that will come down the line. Yeah, yeah, can you back to the cluster? Um, okay, I'm gonna have to keep moving after this question, but thank you for asking questions. Um, uh, yes. You can, um, well, so for one thing, Streamlit just is pure Python. So Streamlit run basically just says, run this script. Uh, well, you'll see what Streamlit run is. We haven't gotten there. Um, it's, 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 the, it's the same thing as Python, but it means run it as an app rather than as a script. Um, uh, so in that sense, the entire Python ecosystem is instantly available to Streamlit. So uh, any kind of thing that you could import uh, in your environment, uh, Spark, whatever it is, is available to you um, as a Streamlit uh, app developer. Uh, then there's another question about how do you deploy to clusters, um, which is something that you can read tutorials about and also something that I can talk about after the talk. But I think I should keep moving because uh, we gotta, there's a lot more cool stuff I hope to show you. Um, any more questions? Well, no, no more questions. Uh, no more questions for another minute or two. Okay, um, so that's Streamlit Hello. Uh, so 
Let's see here. Okay, uh, did anyone have any trouble installing? Cool. Yeah? Two people? Yes? Oh, Watchdog. Okay, are you in Conda? No. You're not in Conda? What, what, what operating system are you on? Uh, Mac OK, OK. Um, uh, OK, <laughs> Watchdog is like the bane of our existence, basically. Um, it turns out that uh, it requires, um, it needs to be built because it uses some operating system resources. And uh, we might just push some like upstream changes to it, but um, it doesn't always compile properly. My suggestion is to build Streamlit in a um, virtual env uh, or in Conda, um, and, and then it should work. So I apologize for that, yeah. Oh, there is also a way of disabling Watchdog, which I am forgetting at the moment. Um, so I will think about that, but yeah, I'm gonna get back to you. Any other? Okay, let's get moving. So, oops, not what I meant to do. Cool. All right. So now, <clears throat> this was to your question about Shiny. Let's talk about what is the, uh, how does this work? So our goal was we really wanted to make someone who is comfortable writing Python scripts sort of immediately have the superpower of being a Python app developer. How do we do that? Streamlit works on three simple principles. If you understand those principles, you understand all of Streamlit. Number one, embrace Python scripting. So Streamlit apps are actually just scripts that run from top to bottom. So if you can write everything that you can do in a Python script, factor things into functions, write it in your favorite uh, IDE, whatever, it all works perfectly in Streamlit. So this is a little hello world, we'll write this in a second. Uh, and there it is executing as an app. Okay, number two, treat widgets as variables. So here in my script, you see that I've inserted this uh, streamlet function called st.slider. And anytime you have a variable anywhere in your scripts that you'd like to make interactive, you can just substitute st.slider or any kind of widget that you want and it sort of automatically uh, assembles the UI so that that's now um, a, something that can be changed interactively, okay? And finally, reuse data and computation. So I'm gonna talk about this thing called uh, ST cache, but what that allows us to do is actually play this trick of rerunning scripts over and over again without it being insanely slow by caching computation. Okay, so that's the uh, basic uh, of, of Streamlit. And um, so now to actually play around with this, who got Streamlit installed on their computer? Raise your hand. Oh, sweet, yes, um, high numbers. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask you guys to go to a GitHub repo and um, just copy a little bit of code. So go to github.com slash Streamlit. I'll do it myself. GitHub, okay, I'll do it over here. Oh, there it is. GitHub.com slash Streamlit, here we are. It's probably way too small for you to see. And then we're gonna go to um, demo Uber NYC pickups. Really the only reason why we're doing this part is because there's like a little snippet of code to download the data that's super annoying to write and I would not wanna describe it to you like character by character. So we're gonna go here. Here is, um, here's, here we are and then we're gonna Click on app.py. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, let's just zoom in a little bit. Let's grab everything from line 47 up. Oops, we don't need the whole license. We can start at import stream with SST. And I'm gonna move this. What's that? 47. Oh, sorry, 18 to 47, yeah. Really, really, we, we just want 38 to 44, to be honest. Um, that's the kind of gnarly part, but just, we'll, get, we'll grab this whole thing. Oh, we also need the, 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 the bucket. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna copy this. 
And I'm going to go over to my text editor here. Oops, I already pasted it in. And here we have uh, lines one through, now, that, now it's one through 29. So raise your hand if you are at this point. Okay. Cool. We had like a 90% drop in. Uh, <laughs> in uh, so the point is uh, have these first 29 lines in a text editor, basically. Like this is in VS Code. I have VS Code on the left. Um, I, no, so we have a different model than the reactive uh, computation that you'll see in Chinese. So you'll see, it's, it's not very complicated and we're about to get to it actually, so yeah. Um, so yeah, the question was, what's the, re what's the relationship between uh, caching and reactive computation? So there are some deep connections, but we, I, I won't go too, too much into that now, but I think you'll see when, by demonstration that how it works. Okay, are you guys all here? So um, raise your hand if you need a little more time. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, this, this guy I'm calling it hello.py. Um, you could call it anything you want. I'm going to, um, and here we are on my, my little uh, text editor here. I'm going to say streamlet run hello.py. Okay, um, so what's going on here? So a uh, couple things. Um, first of all, we have this little title thing at the top. So um, these are these, you know, there, there's actually very few function calls in Streamlit, so it's pretty easy to learn. Um, but you know, we have st title, uh, or another way that we could do that is we could just say st write. Um, oh, and now when I save my file, this is a little trick that we're just borrowing from like web development. Uh, it's actually going to scan the file, and it's going to say, we saw a change in your file. Do you want to uh, update what you're seeing on the right? So I'm going to say, yes, I do want to do that. Always rerun. Okay. And now you see that Uber pickups in New York City got smaller. And this is actually marked down, so we could just make it big again, or we can make it a little bit smaller. Oops. Uh, the other thing that we could do, by the way, if you're in Python 3, is you can, anytime Streamlit sees a uh, Python object, uh, which is not a function call, um, it, uh, it, it wraps it in st.write. So we could also just go like this. Oops. Okay, so that looks kind of nice. We could also get rid of this markdown. Oops. I'm just showing some random stuff. You don't need to follow along with this. I'll, I'll tell you when to follow along again. Okay, cool. And we could add some Ys. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm actually going to delete this because who cares? So now here's where things are interesting. We're going to load a little bit of data uh, from uh, from the web, and then we're going to do some non-trivial computation. Like, well, this is not like mind-blowing computation that will get at you a PhD, but it actually takes a little bit of time, which is what I mean by non-trivial. So. Um, First of all, we're going to load 100,000 lines of this data. These are Uber pickups in New York City. It's the fun little data set you can get online. And we're going to uh, rename the columns. Um, and we are going to convert one of the columns, which is a string, to a date time. And believe it or not, well, you probably you guys know this. It act, that's actually a very time consuming thing to do. Uh, it's like a high entropy code path to turn a string into a date time. So OK. Uh, and now, now we can take a look at the data. So I'm just going to say uh, data. And I'm going to tell Streamlit to display it. OK. And, uh, and here we're looking at these pickups. So what do we have here? These are This is the date time of the pickup. Um, and then this is the latitude. And this is the longitude. And this is something called a base that we have no idea what that is. But it's always the same thing. Um, and typically. And a script like this would actually be 
um, slow to rerun because we have to go to the web, download all this data, do all these transformations. So why is it not slow in this case? It's because of this ST cache annotation. Uh, actually, we don't need this either. This, you can keep it if you want, but I'm going to delete it. Um, so uh, here it is running. Um, and then what this annotation does is basically say store this data. And then every time I see this function call again, if I already know the answer, just substitute it back in. So uh, for major computer science nerds, this is just memoization. Uh, but um, it, uh, in this case, um, it means that we can uh, now play with this data set like basically interactively, even in the context of this script. So for example, um, I can add, we can look at only the Uber pickups at noon. So I'll say hour equals noon, and then we'll do a little filter. Date, time, DT. Okay, and now we're looking at only the uh, Uber pickups at noon. And if I change this to 11, this is sort of the beginning of the streamlit magic. It updates instantly. Okay. Is anyone following along at this point <laughs> in terms of actually coding? Yes, there's a question right there. Uh, you're you're seeing a blank page. Um, my guess, try, okay, this is what I would do. Um, I'm going to just get rid of everything here except for the streamlet. Pretend it's not there. And we're just going to say st.write, hello world. Oops. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, I need to get rid of this too. There we go. I would just try these two lines of code, and uh, and if that doesn't work, then then uh, we'll have to think more deeply. Yes. So everything is not like when I was working for software, the graphs are just embedded. Right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I was speaking very quickly. So the question is like, what's this thing about wrapping stuff in st.write? First of all, you can just not do that. Um, and it just use st.write ordinarily and it'll, everything will work. Uh, I, there's actually a slightly more complicated description of what gets automatically st written. It's uh, a sort of naked object sitting in your buffer um, that's not a function call, it's not a comment, it's not a um, if statement or while statement or other kind of syntactic construct. So, um, you know, I, for example, I could say uh, true, and it'll say true. But if I said if true, it won't say anything because if true is, doesn't fall into the special category of things. But if I say if true 42, then it'll do that. Uh, last question for now, yeah. So I ran your data earlier, so I got 92,000 rows back. Okay. So loading 100,000 rows, uh -huh. the same 100,000 rows that I did it it, it's really about what is this st.cache thing doing and what happens, I think what you're asking is what happens if you mutate the object that comes out of st.cache? Is that the question? Yeah, like I mutated it the way that you described here. Uh -huh. 93,000 rows instead of 100,000 Yeah. But all of those rows are within that hour. Yes. Or a much smaller chunk of those rows are within that hour. So was more rows, were more rows that or was that? Um, there, it should, uh, it's, an, it's an important constraint that always the same number, the same thing will happen every time your script runs if you don't change anything. Uh, so um, I, I would be su surprised if that weren't the case, um, but, but, but that's certainly the mental model, and I could, I could look at your code and see what's going on. But just to give you a, a sense, um, here if I say uh, data and then len data, so I have 33,900. If I change it to 11 a.m., 
I have 3,977. If I change it back, it goes back. So that should always be the same. Okay, is your question answered? Okay, cool. We can, yes, go ahead. Your hello world worked? Yay! Okay, um, so uh, I, I think it's gonna be impossible for everyone to follow along perfectly with the code the whole time, but if you can, please do, and if not, I think the, uh, the you can gestalt what's going on. Any other questions? Cool. Um, all right, so. Where, where we are now is that we have this ability to um, quickly filter through this data just by changing um, one variable here. So there it's 10 a.m., 11 a.m. Um, okay, let's do something more fun, which is actually map the data. So let's, just, let's, let's say raw data. Raw data at, okay. You don't have to do exactly what I'm doing here, but this, okay, so this is the raw data at 11 a.m. Now let's actually map it. So we'll, put something here and we'll say geo data. And now I'm gonna use a new visualization function which is st.map. Okay. Now we're actually looking at where these pickups are happening, right? Um, and this is, by the way, using DeckGL. And so uh, this is pretty cool. Um, so now we're gonna to get to how would you uh, play with interaction. Um, and so the, the first thing to note is that basically all I've shown you right now is how to write scripts that output something to a web browser like super quickly and hopefully not without too much difficulty. But this is not what you would call an app yet, okay? But on the other hand, it is very much in the style of an ordinary Python script. We load some data, we transform it and so on. Okay, so now we're gonna make it into an actual app. So as I mentioned, let's, let's substitute this variable for a, uh, for a widget. So let's call this hour, and here we go, min value, max value, okay, so 0, 24, actually I think it's 23, there we go. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can see this better, okay. And now you'll see that as I change, let's zoom in a little bit here. As I change this, um, everything updates, right? Um, and in fact, uh, you'll like for example, it's not like rebuilding the web page from scratch every time. In fact, it's very intelligently diffing uh, what was in the web page with respect to the data that your app has and then sending only the deltas that are required to make that possible. That's one of the reasons why it's so fast. Um, and, uh, and so, okay, H had I not known how ST Slider works, just I'm just randomly riffing here, uh, we could actually just take a look at ST Slider. And here is the uh, documentation for it, it's a fun little trick. Um, uh, another fun little trick is like, well, you know, this kind of annoying how uh, this thing is, is right there. Uh, maybe I can move it to the left. So instead of saying st.slider, there's another area you have access to, which is called the sidebar. st.sidebar.slider. And now we've got a nice little sidebar there. Let's zoom out. Cool. Right? And now this map. It's a little boring. Uh, it so happens that DeckGL is like super amazing and like insanely customizable. Um, rather than actually type in all kinds of crazy DeckGL, I'm just going to copy it from GitHub because it looks cooler that way. So we're just going to replace that one line with about maybe 15 lines of code. Okay, and now we have a really cool 3D visualization of all these different things, right? And, and by the way, you know, if we didn't like a slider, we could make this a, um, what, what, can we, what could we make this? Oh, I think we have something called a num input now. This is actually cool. Oops. No. Well, we'll leave it as a slider for now. I can't remember what it's called. If someone, if someone, yeah, go ahead. What's that? What's that? Oh, I typed number. Oh, cool. Oh. There we go, cool. 
So now we have the same thing, but with a different kind of widget, for example. Um, and then here too, like you know, maybe you know, we we don't we don't always want to look at these. This is more sort of like a debugging thing. So I'm going to show you another cool thing we could do. We could say we're going to use a different type of construct if st.checkbox show raw data. Okay, so now the data is kind of hidden back there. See that? So notice that we're not writing any callbacks, we're not doing any kind of declarative layout, we're really just instrumenting a script with these ST calls. And what they're doing is they're allowing us to control the control flow at the same time as insert UI elements, which produce this script that you can uh, play with uh, and, and share with others. In case anyone's wondering whether you can run Streamlit in a Jupyter Hub instance, the answer, many people have asked this, and the answer has been no until about five minutes ago when mathematicalmichael.com just demonstrated that it is possible, and I have no idea what kind of magic uh, was involved in doing that, but that's super awesome. So, uh, so maybe, hopefully you'll share that with the community. Um, cool. All right, uh, good. Hopefully everyone's feeling a little stretched out. Um, so let's build a data app. Okay, so uh, in this final segment, I wanted to uh, share with you uh, a little bit about sort of a more advanced use case for Streamlit. So the, even though these fundamental building blocks are themselves extremely uh, easy, hopefully, if not, you should let us know because we're constantly trying to make them easier. I'm not kidding. Uh, but even though they're hopefully not you know, super sophisticated, there's not a huge amount to learn about Streamlit, you can actually build really non-trivial apps quite quickly. And so I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit about one of the really driving uh, use cases behind uh, the creation of Streamlit, which was my experience at Zoox working on self-driving cars. And so what we did was all of the, uh, I was an engineering manager there, and all of the engineering managers would meet once a week, and we would basically look at um, instances where the car hadn't behaved as we expected. And so this was the operator of the self-driving car, it pushed a button or whatever, um, that, uh, figuratively speaking, that uh, caused the car to disengage, okay? And then that was an issue that had to be resolved uh, that week, basically. And so, uh, in a sense, this workflow was similar to the software engineering workflow, where you have issues coming in, and then you need to they go into GitHub or whatever, Jira, and then you, they get assigned to people, and then they get fixed. But in this amorphous, crazy world of you know, semi-intelligent vehicles and machine learning, it wasn't that simple, right? You couldn't root cause a neural network. So what was the actual flavor of like debugging a self-driving car? So what it really was, was the, the engineering leader sitting around a, a table um, and we would sort of open up, this is, this is Waymo, uh, just copied off the web by the way, but same idea. Uh, we would open up an instance, it's a little hard to see there, but in this case what we have is, it looks like a, uh, someone in a wheelchair following a dog around on the street. And this is the kind of thing, and this is actually quite an exotic example, but this is the kind of thing that happens all the time when you're debugging self-driving cars, is that like every single week, no matter how many years you've been working at this, some crazy thing happens that you've never seen before. And you're like, how is the car gonna behave in this case? So that's perhaps another answer to the question why this is taking so long. Um, there's tons of weird examples about this. Maps are like that too, by the way. Um, every time you think you've made a map that's like centimeter accurate, some crazy thing happens in the world and your, your map is broken. Okay, so what we'd do is we'd say, let's figure out uh, at this point, and this is a very complicated, this, you know, this is not just the people in the room, there's like project managers and product managers and stuff, there's this entire sort of ecosystem working on this problem. People are trying to say, at this point in time, can we understand what all the sensors were doing, what, in what state all the neural nets were, et cetera, et cetera? 
the planner, and then can we uh, get it in some sense to an engineer or an engineering team who can sort of break it down further and try to like quote unquote reproduce this case. But because there's no such thing as reproduction as such, um, the, uh, I mean, you, could, you can replicate the state of everything on, on the vehicle, um, but that, that's only one instance in time. What you're trying to get is a more general understanding of what broke down, okay? What you really want to do is you actually want to create essentially um, searches over your data set for similar instances in time. And then what you want to be able to do is essentially regress those searches over your data sets against different versions of the software running on the car. So you, the, the picture here is that we have uh, this data, which is vast. It's you know terabytes or exabytes, God knows what, of data. And uh, we want to find subsets of it that are similar to this error case. And then on a, in the other column, we have quote unquote column, or let, let's say dimension, we have all the models, like quote unquote models, because really there's like many, many models running simultaneously on the vehicle. But again, we're gonna sort of sidestep that and just think theoretically. So we have data along one dimension, we have models along another dimension, and we wanna be able to quickly subset uh, some of these and then look at the intersection, how would the models run on this data? That's sort of the beginning of the process of, of debugging some kind of crazy thing that's happening on a self-driving car. And, and by the way, this is all, you know, when I was at Google X, I wasn't working on the self-driving car team, but I was close to them. And I, this is the exact same process in every uh, project uh, that's working on self-driving cars, no doubt. And so um, what happened was the uh, engineering teams eventually through this complicated, slow process, uh, start, built internal tooling that made this better and better. And week after week, more features were added until we actually had these really beautiful tools that allowed us to interrogate our own data and then run, run models against it. And this kind of internal tooling is being replicated not only in every self-driving car, uh, project, uh, but also really in every machine learning project on some level, and especially once you get to a certain size team. So this is an example of sort of the hidden, bespoke internal tooling layer that floats beneath uh, the, the amazing mathematics and, uh, uh, and, and futuristic technologies of machine learning. And so um, we built an example of this tool in Streamlit. Now, it's a very small, uh, simplified example, but it gives you some idea of how, uh, of how this works. Um, and so I will invite you to go check out this out on GitHub. I'm not gonna invite you to run it because it's gonna download a three gigabyte uh, neural network. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's 500 megabytes, I can't remember. Uh, well, actually, I'll tell you right now. Bring up my, bring up my thing. We'll close the Streamlit browser. Oops. Why did I interrupt it? Oh, just Control C. You can't interrupt yours. Okay. Uh, well, I'll help you with that afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you. By the way, you can also open another terminal and kill it if uh, if uh, if uh, all else fails. Okay. Okay, so it's 200 megabytes. Point is, if I tell you guys to do this right now all at the same time, you're all gonna simultaneously download 200 megabytes, and that would probably just kill the Wi-Fi and make it horrible for everyone. So uh, I don't wanna take responsibility for, for the Pi Data LA Wi-Fi system. So I already have it downloaded, and then afterwards you should feel free to do what I'm about to do. Try it at home, or try it at your hotel room. So um, here we're gonna go to, let's go back to the um, Streamlit GitHub. By the way, this is Streamlit itself, and as I mentioned, it is an open source project. We're actually getting a whole bunch of um, contributions from the community, not a huge number. We've been in public for about two months, but I think we've gotten like uh, 15 or so pull requests, which is like super exciting. And then there's also lots of other stuff uh, on the forums and Twitter and all that stuff, as you can check out. Um, but, and you know, Apache too, and uh, you, can, you can play with all this stuff. Um, and look through it more importantly. Um, but uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this demo self-driving thing. And here is another, it's just another little example of uh, Streamlit. Um, and I could download this file, but we have a cool little feature, which is that you could just run 
a Python script directly off um, any URL. So really all this, it is running locally on my computer, just downloading it first, and then, then it's running that. Um, so it's just a little time saver. So we're gonna run this baby. Boom. Okay. All right. Um, and so here we are in the app. And uh, I'm gonna go down here to show the source code. Uh, honestly, the point is that this is the entire source code. It's 300 lines. And uh, if you look carefully, okay, let's actually go into the source code and zoom in, you'll see that like literally this is everything that you're seeing, including actually running the neural net somewhere around here, layer by layer, okay? The whole thing is happening and we're not like hiding things in other libraries or something. So this is the source code. Again, it's 300 lines of Python, only 30 streamlet calls. Okay, and uh, so there's some streamlet calls right there. Okay, and um, so let, let's, let's run this and see what happens. So here we go to run the app. Okay, so it's doing some SD cache stuff. Uh, load metadata, by the way, is building this little search engine uh, over the data set. This is the Udacity self-driving car data set. So it's just a nice data set of um, images with boxes around them, basically. Um, and so here, we're, here we can start to say, let's say that the situation was, um, I, you know, we, we, we ran into a situation where there was, um, there were a, a large number of traffic lights, let's say. So let's go to here and we'll say traffic lights. And then we'll go for a large number of traffic lights. Um, and then here, we, actually there's only six images in the data set with over 14 traffic lights, of course. Who's ever heard of over 14 traffic lights? But here we can scrub through it. Right, let's, let's go for pedestrians. You know what, actually, let's make this like way bigger because it's more fun. We can get into the more z normal zoom levels. Okay, so, uh, so there we got like a lot of pedestrians now. And here we can scrub through it. Um, and notice all of this is written without callbacks in the same exact sort of data flow style that I described to you earlier. It's just a script that's run from top to bottom, but it gives you this really convincing illusion of an app, you might say. And then notably down here, it's actually running a neural net in real time. So, and just to, to prove that, here we can um, we can we can change parameters of the neural net itself. So uh, you'll see that as I increase the confidence threshold, um, more and more people get classified as uh, people. Um, and then as I decrease it, you know, fewer and fewer. Uh, and then similarly, there's this thing called the overlap threshold. Um, so these are actually these are actually parameters of the net itself. So this net is pre-trained. Um, well, actually, it's not parameters of the net. It's parameters of the post-processing uh, that happens after the neural net is run. So all these objects are detected using YOLO, which is a super awesome uh, object detection uh, net, by the way. And um, and then you do a little post-processing to figure out um, uh, what's the overlap threshold and stuff of boxes. And um, and these are the kinds of like, you know, as I don't need to tell you, of millions and millions of tiny little parameters that are inside the neural net system and which are extremely difficult to debug and really gain intuition about at all. And so you can imagine that we would have not only this one model, but perhaps thousands of versioned models that we could then run against this data set. And so this is an example of an app that like on the one hand, it's not very complicated. It seems almost like formulaic perhaps. Um, just grab some data, grab a model, run one against the other. But on the other hand, there's a lot of very minor, bespoke things about it. And so the ability of, for a machine learning engineer or data scientist to build this him or herself directly, open it up and fiddle with it, and then make it available to other people inside the organization, uh, to their coworkers, to their uh, executives, to their interns, uh, and poten potentially far beyond the machine learning group was really what we were trying to go for uh, when we created Streamlit. And uh, hopefully it's something that, that you guys are also resonating with as both part of your workflow um, and also um, a, a skill that, that, that could be useful to you. Um, so quick question, yeah? Mm -hmm. Let's say you have other associates that are needing to uh, get inference from data 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- yeah. So, th- so there's um, th- basically the the. Uh, it was more of a statement than a question, which is that this would be really useful to sort of uh, serve a model, not in the sense of, let's say, an API endpoint, which is not the point, but actually as a t- data app, as it were, with inference. Yeah, and that is um, uh, that is very much one of the use cases that, that we had in mind. So, th- so that's exactly right. Um, I would also inc- encourage you guys to go to, um, well, if you're interested, go to Twitter and type in Streamlit. You'll find that people have put up like thousands of different apps. You can also search on, on GitHub for Streamlit. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things that people are doing now. So there's there's those kinds of like um, deploy, a wrap, an inference uh, of some kind. Uh, there's people who are just demonstrating really cool um, like demonstrating their GitHub repos. Uh, we're seeing that more and more, like, oh, if you want to see how this thing works, just pip install Streamlit and you can use, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then there's uh, annotation tasks. Uh, there's uh, just a whole bunch of weird science stuff going on in Streamlit, which is like, really delightful and, and makes it super fun to go to work. Okay, uh, another question? Uh-huh. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, the question was, could we pr- could we just uh, render this down to an HTML document, remove the back end? Yes. So that's a great question. Uh, yes. And that's what the Bado library is for. <laughs> um, so you can, if you go to streamlit.io slash docs, uh, we describe, so this has only been out for two months and we're, we're gonna make it cooler and cooler and cooler. Um, right now, there's some things that are a little bit, uh, you have to just do it yourself. In this case, if you go to the config file, you can configure it so that you can save HTML files out and you can save it to S3 buckets and that's what Bado is for. So, um, yes. Uh, so uh, you cannot save it outside of S3 buckets now because that's the only use case that we coded. Um, that being said, it's an open source project and that's a very great use case and it's not a big delta from what we have now. It's, it's in fact, actually that part of the whole program is a plugin system. So you could have like the file system save or you could have a GCP save. We just only wrote one plugin for it so far. So there's a lot of things like that in Streamlit where it's like we have really big plans and we'd love to engage the community in helping us like build out all these things um, and, and also gain ideas for how to build things. I, I'll, I'll incidentally mention that um, almost every good idea in Streamlit was just came up with people who were using it, especially during this year long beta period. So there's a really long private beta period where we just got tons of ideas from the community. So now that things are growing, we're trying to sort of scale up that same process, but to, to many more users. Okay, uh, a question in the back? So you said that email and SOP were probably real time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the question is, is it expensive to run inference uh, with neural nets? Uh, and so the answer is um, uh, yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, let's see. We actually have a really cool GAN demo um, that you should check out where you can like morph faces and stuff. Um, and that's a really fun Streamlit application. And we haven't put the source code up just because we haven't had time to. but. I, that, uh, I think we'll probably do it in like the next month or so. So you can play with GANs and Streamlit and it's super fun. Uh, number two, um, training neural nets is much more expensive than running inference on them. So actually deploying an app which runs inference like at the speed of someone clicking is like orders and orders of magnitude less computationally expensive than actually training a neural net at the speed of a GPU. And so in that sense, um, uh, it's probably not something to be concerned about in most applications. Um, I will mention that people have been st- starting to train neural nets in Streamlit and using Streamlit as a front end to that process, sort of as like a, a bit of a, um, uh, almost like a tensor board um, alternative, which is not a, a sort of main use case for us, but another cool idea. Yeah, so. You said most of it, it most of the time runs locally unless you hook it up to some cloud server. Mm-hmm.
That's right. That's right. So the key thing here is that we do not, uh, nothing here is running on any cloud server as the, in the demo that I just showed you. It's just running localhost 8501. So the only cloud server that's being connected is one which is actually measuring a very little anonymized information, like was an app created or, or was an app basically uh, interacted with. And we use that because that helps us um, understand it and also demonstrate to our investors that people are interested in using Streamlit. So we, you can turn it off, but we would prefer that you leave it on. Um, yes. Is it possible to upload data? Oh, to, you mean you, you want to upload data in the UI? Yes. Um, that is uh, a feature that should be coming out like, next week, uh, which is the file uploader widget. Um, and in fact, to, if you want uh, proof of this, go to GitHub and search the issues for file uploader widget. And I think it's all been merged in. So uh, it should be coming out in 0.52. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so the enterprise version is called Streamlit for Teams, and um, there are two versions, and we're not sure which one uh, we are going to come out with. We're developing it right now. We're not sure which one we're going to come out with yet. Um, the first one is an on-prem version. That's something that we have running uh, like on our servers in, in our organization. Um, and then there's also a cloud version for, for like smaller, typically smaller organizations who don't like have a huge on-prem on uh uh, uh, installation. So um, that's something that we're developing right now. Um, it's We're doing it with a small number of partners who are existing Streamlit users, but you can actually go online to streamlit.io slash four teams and type in your email address if you want to get added to the waiting list and uh, people will contact you and say how big is your organization and stuff. And so we're, we're certainly looking for it to gain insight into how people might use the deployed version. Um, but that's, that's not available yet. Um, so it's coming out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that you actually have a suite with 10,000 different participants. Mm -hmm. And so do you have a mechanism for hooking into, okay, I've got this thing. Can I hook it into a regression suite and see how it performs against the regression suite? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very, okay, that's a very sophisticated and fascinating question, which is how could, what's the next part of the, uh, of the workflow for a machine learning engineer who's doing debugging in the sort of self-driving car use case? And is there a way of, of maybe, maybe uh, plugging it into a regression suite or something? So um, that's not a, a problem that we don't consider that a part of the Streamlit problem definition as such. We view Streamlit as an app development framework for others, it's a canvas for others to create apps in. Um, we chose Python as the launch language for sort of infinite reasons, but one of them is that there is a very large ecosystem of plugins for you know, basically every other SaaS service out there. So uh, the limit's really your imagination, and, uh, and certainly if you come up with cool um, integrations with other services, uh, feel free to put them on the, on the web too uh, as separate open source projects, uh, or you can do pull requests against Streamlit, and, uh, and the ecosystem can hopefully get richer that way. Okay, um, we're just at the end of the uh, talk here. So, um, oh, we are at the end of the talk here. Um, so thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and I'm available to chat with people afterwards, but thank you so much. <laughs>